for a mid-size uh, to small investment bank. You know, you have in the in you had you know Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs were a lot bigger than Lehman, and then above that you had all these commercial banks, and that, that's very important. Yeah. As, you, as you as you know, around uh, two, 2000 we had the dismantle of the Glass Steagall Act, and yeah. what put Lehman in a very vulnerable position, Matt, is what we noticed around 2004, 2005, you had these big commercial banks like Citigroup and J.P. Morgan. They were they were they were really coming into all of Lehman's business channels. Right. I mean, if you think of an investment bank, an investment bank is like a 767 with 16 engines. Yeah. yeah and yeah. Uh, these, you know, and these these big commercial banks were getting into every pocket yeah. of the same type of businesses that Lehman was in. And in order to get, you now, you have to realize that. Say J.P. Morgan and Citigroup, they have close to close to two trillion dollars yeah. of deposits. Well, again, I love customer. And I love yeah. how you start. You know, I love how you start out in the prologue talking about if only, if only, if only. You know, all these yeah. uh, segues of events that happened, and and you know, and uh, really, uh, City um, uh, breaking the law with the deal with Travelers. I mean, technically, and and then they, you know, yeah. they had the, they had the money. They had the money to battle uh, Congress and Clinton and. Finally, you know, it was probably two years after they announced the deal, they got glass steagall repealed, right? And it was uh, finally November of 99. So, you know, the, yeah. the whole, this, whole, this whole past decade really uh, was preceded by that, that act being repealed. And, and, and I mean, do you, in my mind, I've always felt that way. And, and you kind of you know, you kind of lynch on it. You said, well, there was a lot of things. But, you know, this one, you know, law change really shifted, as you said, because... All of a sudden, you guys, uh, at Lehman, were being attacked by traditional banks that were just lenders, and all of a sudden they're in the, and all of a sudden they're big major uh, players in the trading desks and the investment banking side of things, and they weren't necessarily in that middle level doing the bond deals. Now they're everywhere, and, and you're, you know, you're, you're mm. you know, you're being cherry picked everywhere, and these guys have, you know, as you said, deeper pockets than anybody else. So, and then the pockets got real deep. With you know, yeah. with the printing of money, exactly. And well, that's what we saw. I'll never forget being on the trading floor in 2005, and I'm sitting sitting next to Peter Shellback, who's our best bank loan trader in the firm. Uh, he came over from Goldman Sachs. Uh, great talent, and uh, you know, he was all. He always had very. Excuse me. He always had very. Uh, I just got to take this one. Yeah, Mark, send him on up. Okay. Uh, he always had very profound things he would say, and and one day I'll never forget when he said was that, that Lehman Brothers, he felt, uh, and Larry felt that Lehman back then, even in 2005, was levering up the balance sheet just to compete with you know Citigroup and J.P. Morgan. In other words, when I got to the firm, our leverage was 20 to one, and by 2000. Uh, eight when I left the firm, we were forty-four to one. Yeah, and so. which is which is astounding. And, and and obviously that must have been what happened. Uh, you know, again, I haven't looked at the the bear model enough, but they must have been levered similarly. I mean, the numbers had to be similar, maybe even higher. I don't know. Um, yeah, no, yeah, bear was probably forty-six, forty-seven to one. Yeah. In other words, let me give an example. What that so we had seven hundred and eighty billion at the top, at the very top, we had seven hundred and eighty billion dollars worth of. Uh, stocks, bonds, commercial real estate, residential real estate, oil, gold, you know, commodities, treasuries, missile bonds. So we had 780 billion, but we only had 18 billion of net tangible equity. It's just here. astounding. So, yeah, it is because if you if you and like you, know, you said, lose, all, it's like, like going to like you said a five percent haircut on that 780, yeah. and you're done. And that's yeah, it's like going to a casino. Yeah. You go in a casino and you have a hundred real dollars, but you're betting for you know forty four hundred. Right. But you only have a hundred bucks in your pocket. <laughs> but I'm gonna put forty four hundred on the table, baby. Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, and, you know, it's like yeah, it's like it's like you know, I see it in the in the future side. You know, people come in with twenty five grand, and some of these uh, futures uh, brokerages will give you uh, you know they'll let you trade um, you know twenty five lots when you should really only be trading one lot. You know, it's the same thing. Yeah. It's un it's unbelievable, and, and and people don't understand. They only look at the upside, and so so being. Let, let's talk about you know you're being there, and, and and I can totally relate, and and I felt your emotion, you know, talking about you know as early as oh four, and and I think you started there. Was it oh three oh four? 
Yeah, I started in the, the, the summer of '04. So you and, and you already kind of had this bearish bent going on with with the markets, as I did, and I was running a short. I was running a short only, you know, short bias hedge fund from '03 through '06. So and, and I was having positive returns, but. Believe me, you, when you write about the fact, and, and I, I can't remember her name, but I really felt her emotion when she left in 07, uh, the trader that, you know, the analyst. Christine. That just, yeah, Christine, that just did great work, and, and she said, "There's, I don't understand this. You know, basically, I, I you know, she threw in the cards. And, <laughs> yeah, and she, I, she was just beside herself. Yeah, and, and, you know, and, and, and the, the, you, you had distressed debt trading at, you know, Calpine right. bonds were trading at 110, 120 right. in bankruptcy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and like she said, you know, the 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 you know the the GM didn't make sense, you know, AIG, all these things were were flaring up back then, but it took so long. Why do you think it took so long for all this to play out? And it still hasn't finished playing out, obviously. And and I'm curious to hear wh where you think, how does it all play out? Well, uh, it, it took so long because. You know, bubbles always last longer. I mean, and, you know, you know, Alan Greenspan's irrational exuberance speech was like a year and a half, two, two years before the top. You know, in equity yeah. markets. Yeah. And and it's almost like these bubbles when there's that afterburner phase of all bubbles when people just uh, the let you know when you have that real buy-in from you know that last group when every you know the last doubter is jumps in the in, in the water and uh, yeah. and and that's. You know that's what what really happened, and um, you know now you look around the street, and uh, I really think we have to break up these uh, the, these banks. I mean, I don't think they're too big to fail. I mean, I think they're too big to succeed. Yeah. I mean, get, get digging deep inside this story, uh, the one thing I've really discovered is that uh, you know you just can't manage risk. In these big organizations, Lehman Brothers in 1998, their balance sheet was 38 billion, and then when I left the firm, it was 780. You know, that, it's, it's you just insane. can't manage that type of risk. No, you can't. So, I mean, but, do uh, you think? I mean, do you think that'll be a trend that'll start? You'll start seeing some. You know, you'll, you'll start seeing uh, banks sell off parcels think, and pieces. Yeah, I think the government's going to force like, you know, spinoffs and. You know, I think Merrill Lynch might eventually get spun out of Bank Bank America. You know, it yeah. might take a year or two. But uh, you know that's the key, and then and and and, and uh, you know we get to eliminate you know CEO and chairman of the board. You know you, you can't have a systemically risky bank anywhere the CEO is also chairman of the board. Right. But, but but let's let's talk a little bit about that leverage because it's still in the system, and 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 where does what happens? I mean, where, where, where does that go? Where does leverage go? How does it get, how does it get pressed out of the system? I mean, how is that going to happen? I well, mean, well that, that's what's happening now. You have this. Um, the, the big thing is the securitization markets were they created Goldilocks, and I think you understand it, Matt. But I don't know if the, you know the, many people don't understand, especially these economists that we were watching in, in uh, 2005, 2006. They couldn't explain what was going on, going on, so they kept on saying Goldilocks, Goldilocks. It wasn't Goldilocks. It was 17 trillion dollars of CMBS, RMBS, ABS, these right. securitized, securitized products that created. Um, so much free money. That's why you saw all these skyscrapers in Miami in 2005, and that's why yeah. you saw all these skyscrapers around here because the CMBS market was funding everything. And right. in the old days, if you were, if you and I wanted to build a building and say a skyscraper, we would have to go to a bank like, uh, or a bank or an insurance company like MetLife or whatever, or Hartford, say, here's what we want to do, and we'd have, and basically we'd have like one or two. Uh, financiers, yeah, but the CMBS market right. created financing around the world where they sliced up these loans in little pieces, and they had participants all around the world. So that allowed a firm like Lehman Brothers to buy a core de France in France, which was a 2.5 billion dollar company. So to answer right. your question about the unwind, uh, 2.5 billion dollar building. Um, to answer your question about the unwind, the unwind will take is taking place. Uh, the securitization markets aren't working, um, so you know risk is yeah. being unwound. Right. Uh, but it's, it's probably going to. I think we're in the middle of a W. I mean, I think it'll take. You know, we'll have one more phase down in the market, and uh, you know, it's going to take a long time for for a lot of this risk to be unwound.